and thank you for your, your mention on the mental health aspect as well. Um, Dr. Michael Sherman is from Governor Baker's home state, uh, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare. Uh, we welcome you here, Senior VP and Chief Medical Officer, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Governor Christie and uh, Commissioners. Um, I represent Harvard Pilgrim, which serves over one million members in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Maine, and Connecticut. We have a strong culture of supporting the community and working collaboratively with all stakeholders. Um, we've all seen the impact of opioids on our members, on our communities, and we really want to be part of the solution. Let me also add in the way of um, abusing anyone of stereotypes, I'm a physician. I trained with individuals, I worked with individual, individuals, some of whom are dead from opioid overdoses, some of whom had their careers destroyed. These are people who understood intellectually the dangers. I assure you they were the people who in college were studying on Friday nights, not out partying. So um, if, if it can, ha can happen to people like that, it can happen to any of us, and we really need to take this seriously. Um, we are, we're actually fortunate that we um, have in our largest state, uh, Massachusetts, a multi-stakeholder group, the, the Governor's Opioid Working Group. Um, through this task force, working with all the stakeholders to agree on solutions that can be put in place with clear and coordinated messaging. And, and again, that's really important. Health plans sometimes are not seen as being um, the best arbiter of solutions, and by having everyone approach this together with a common goal, um, we, we can put these things in place with, with less pushback. Um, we also operate, though, in three other states, and having each state come up with their own practice can be confusing and create deterrence. So we strongly urge the Commission to look at, nat at best practices across states and come up with national guidelines that we can, that we can all adopt. Um, this is a scourge that doesn't know any state borders. Um, an example of um, something that we've implemented is actually emerged uh, from the Mass Work Group, which is first in it in this, the nation law, which said that individuals, adults getting new prescriptions for opi opioids were limited to seven days uh, for the first fill, and for, for minors, for all prescriptions. And for anyone, they, were, they had the ability to ask the pharmacist for something less than a full fill, and we think we'd like to see that uh, uh, proceed nationally. And I want to stress, if we had done that just as a health plan, I think we would have gotten pushback. Um, some examples of changes that originated within our health plan. Um, we do cover naloxone uh, without any prior authorization, but we don't just cover it. We've eliminated any cost share because we don't think that cost should be a deterrent to having these medications um, handy. We also, like many, cover all sorts um, and all types of medication assistant treatment, again, without prior authorization. Um, we um, do cover methadone maintenance, which in many areas is covered um, through public programs. We, we thought it important to add it. And when we learned that in, in some cases, individuals had daily co-pays because of the daily treatment, we eliminated the cost share on that as well. Um, we're, we also look at the cutting edge treatments that are out there. There's a company actually based in Princeton, New Jersey that has an implant. Um, implanted buprenorphine for substance abuse for six months. By implanting, um, it eliminates diversion. It eliminates uh, people not being adherent. Uh, as soon as it came out, we made it available as a benefit to our members. Uh, again, no prior authorization, no restrictions. If people need it, they need to get it. And we all need to be looking at these newer therapies and working rapidly to make sure that our members have access. Um, we've also heard today about the importance of non-narcotic options for the treatment of pain, such as acupuncture to reduce the use of opioids. We cover acupuncture, but we go a step further, and we're actually working with some large employers to create on-site clinics so that their employees have easy access to, the, to acupuncture and other types of care. We're also working to broaden access to newer modalities, yoga, uh, therapeutic yoga, uh, mindfulness, et cetera. There actually are published studies that indicate the, the benefit of those uh, for certain individuals, and uh, there actually are specialists who, um, in, in those areas who work primarily with pain patients, so it's important to make those available. Um, we believe that abuse deterrent formulations are part of the solu of comprehensive solution, but not a panacea. Uh, we're reviewing how best to incorporate these into our management approach. And for example, based in Massachusetts Chapter 258, we're ensuring that these formulations of opioids are covered in a manner that does not disadvantage them or make them more expensive than the non-abuse uh, than the abuse deterrent formulations. Um, we're also considering innovative contracts with pharma companies that better align incentives with respect to the impact of their products, but are awaiting uh, guidance from groups such as this and the Massachusetts Task Force before moving forward. Um, I would note that there are a limited number of manufacturers making uh, abuse deterrent formulations, so we urge the Commission to provide guidance that will assure that the products are priced in a manner that makes them uh, available to all who need them. Um, 
One other thing we do, which um, is somewhat unique, we have a quality grant fund, which goes back many years. Um, over the past few years, we've tried to focus on medical groups that can use these funds to help address the opioid crisis. Um, an example would be a grant we gave to Maine Quality Counts, which works with many medical groups, and they have a law there that requires physicians to taper those patients who are on high, um, high dose opioids. We gave them a grant to help with education, access to experts virtually, and other resources, training, et cetera, so that they can actually do that. Um, I'm proud to say that thanks to these efforts and those in the community, um, the number of scripts for opioids per member are down 21% since 2014 to today. Um, again, that's not enough, and this feels like a balloon where you attack one part, it comes out somewhere else, so it doesn't mean we are even close to solving this, but it, it does show we can make a difference. Um, some of the challenges, and, and these are not new, so I'll be brief. Um, as you've heard, um, health plans do not have access to prescription drug monitoring programs. I can look them up as a physician, but I can't share them with our pharmacists. Again, uh, physicians are required in many states to query these before writing or, or filling a prescription. Uh, using this in information to help us get a comprehensive picture and determine early on where people are at risk and, and engage. Um, similarly, you've heard about um, 42 uh, CFR Part 2. Um, again, I, I would ask the Commission to work to repeal that. Again, uh, that's something that was put in place with best intentions to protect people's privacy. Um, but the, the reality is that if we have data that suggests that there's a problem, we cannot reach out to a member's primary care physician and make them aware. Um, that, that clearly is in no one's interest. Um, one other comment I would make is um, that lack of consensus as the best practices can lead to friction among providers, patients, policymakers, and health plans. We believe that clear guidance from this commission can really help um, get us around all of those barriers. And uh, finally, thank you for being here, and I appreciate your listening. Dr. Sherman, thank you. Some really interesting things that have come out of your work in Massachusetts and New England. Appreciate you being here. Dr. Edward Ellison. Um, is uh, the Executive Medical Director at the Southern California Pronante Medical Group. Thank you for coming.